They found gravitational waves. They found a signal that was the gravitational waves of two black holes spiraling together and then colliding. Tell me a little bit about what gravitational waves are, uh, why they exist, uh, what causes them, what forms them. So 100 years ago, Einstein was working on his general relativity and special relativity, and he imagined space-time as a sort of a fabric in space. So think of space and time mixed together as opposed to space separate, time separate. So here's a space-time fabric. If you stick a mass on it, it curves the space-time. Earth curves a little bit. The sun curves it more. Yeah. Black holes curve it a lot. In fact, black holes curve it so much that light can't escape from the black holes. So here's the space-time, and the gravitational waves are basically a ripple in the space-time. As two things collided together, the, it sent out ripples through this space-time, through this fabric, and then we detected the ripples here on Earth. If you could, what's the medium that gravitational waves sort of propagate in? We think about sound waves as uh, propagating in air. Uh, what's the medium that, uh, that these gravitational waves propagate in? It's space-time itself. So the fabric of space-time is where these waves are propagating. So sound needs a medium. So the air, the sound, where we're talking to each other, that's the medium of air. Light doesn't need a medium. So we've got electromagnetic radiation, and here's my a mnemonic for red's a long wavelength, blue's a short wavelength. So this doesn't need a medium. This can go through the vacuum of space, what we used to think of as space. But the gravitational waves are going through the fabric of space-time itself. So that is sort of the medium that they're traveling through. They travel at the speed of light, just the way electromagnetic radiation does. Why is it that we haven't been able to uh, detect gravitational waves till now? So in this detection that happened, we moved a mass one five hundredth the width of a proton. So this is a tiny, tiny distance. We need the technology to be able to measure that tiny distance in movement. And so up until now, our sensors just haven't been calibrated enough to, be, to measure that fine a movement in space, so space time. Tell me a little bit about uh, how we look at the universe now and uh, what technologies we've used. So they've got, here's my very fancy technology of uh, imagining the detector. So it's the LIGO detector. It's a laser interferometry gravitational wave observatory. So they, they've got masses on either ends of this, and the masses are essentially the same distance apart. So it's about four kilometers, four kilometers. They bounce a laser beam back and forth between these masses. And they send out a laser beam and it's in phase. So they split the beam, both crests are together, both troughs are together. So they go out, they bounce back, they should be back in phase if it's exactly the same distance. Right. Well, the gravitational wave comes through and it adjusts the distance between this mass and the central mass here. And so this path gets shorter, that path stays the same length if the wave comes in, say, this way. This is now a shorter path, well, that's gonna affect the light. The light's now out of phase with respect to the other companion beam that's there. So they can detect when these beams go out of phase. If they're in phase, you get a nice bright contribution. If they go out of phase, it starts dimming and then goes bright and dimming depending on how out of phase they are. Depending on how fast this, this changes its distance, then we're measuring that signal up, down, up, down sort of thing here. And that's what they were able to detect. And they needed the high precision of this particular device. It looks better than rulers. Yep. Uh, but the high precision to be able to detect that very fine dif difference of 1 500th the size of a proton. That's how far this mass moves. Because when an object is moving toward you or moving away from you, the frequency shifts. So I like to go with a Schneider patented sound effect of Something's coming toward me, it's going to shift high frequency or low wavelength. If it goes away from me, it shifts low frequency, high wavelength. Tell me where on Earth these detectors are, uh, based on that, you've got a globe there, I see. Yeah, both in the U.S., and we've got one down in uh, Louisiana and one up in Washington State. Okay. And so these are set up, they're basically 10 milliseconds apart in terms of light time yeah. travel distance. Um, this signal came in, it hit Louisiana first and then hit Washington, and it was about 7 milliseconds apart. Okay. So it means if you were the black hole colliding, it wasn't lined up this way, it was tilted a little bit more so that it shortened that distance. Okay. If they'd come at exactly the same time, then they'd be lined up perpendicular to where that event was. But we got a 7 second delay, 7 milliseconds delay delay in between the two signals. And they're, they're also angled differently from each other. So that we've got the, one of them's angled something like this, one's angled something like that. So that way we don't miss, if the same event came through, we wouldn't miss both of those events. Where in space did this event occur between the two black holes? Yeah, so I've got another globe, and so this is in the night sky. If you happen to get a clear sky in Michigan, uh, we've got Orion Nebula, a beautiful night sky constellation. So that's sitting right up in the sky. That's right on our ecliptic. So actually, the northern stars in the Orion Nebula are curving toward the North Pole. The southern stars are curving toward the South Pole. So it's a constellation split by our ecliptic. That's our path of the Earth and the Sun and the planets. Uh, but way down here in the southern hemisphere, there's a large Magellanic cloud. 
And we called it a Magellanic Cloud when we were looking at it with very crude devices, either our eyes or telescopes. Well, it's a galaxy. It's a companion galaxy to the, to the Milky Way galaxy, but way down Southern Hemisphere. So they're the ones that actually see the source of where this, at least the galaxy, where the source of these black holes were. Northern Hemisphere, we're not going to be able to see that. What's the impact of this going to be? What are we going to be able to do now that we detect these waves? What, what, what might some of the applications be? So astronomy is dealing with observational stuff, and so we've got light astronomy or electromagnetic radiation astronomy. Now we've got gravitational wave astronomy. So we can now look for uh, circumstances that happen, black holes colliding, neutron stars orbiting other stars. They're gonna be sending out ripples, they're just even fainter than the two black hole ripples. So I think it opens up a window for other observations on events that are going on that leads us to, do we have the equations right? Do we have our calculations right? Are our models correct? We can now verify some of these models that we haven't been able to see black holes colliding before. We've got all kinds of theories about what that would look like. If two black holes collide, that's a pretty cataclysmic event. So that's a big ringing of a bell out there. So we want to measure some of the smaller bells. We want to see um, neutron stars orbiting other stars. And that was our first evidence for gravitational radiation is probably happening out there because the kind of energy loss in a neutron star binary system was measured beautifully. The Taylor Hulse pulsar system, a beautiful agreement with gravitational radiation, but that was more of an indirect. This was a ringing of that space time that came and hit us. This was a much more direct result. One of the things this does is it opens up another window into the universe, and so the old adage of keep watching the skies in terms of be careful of the aliens coming down. No, keep watching the skies in a good way. We've got some great stuff going on out there. We now have increasingly strong abilities to be able to measure some of that stuff.